So I'd like to give a very warm welcome to all our students, professors, and to this international pa panel regarding the Hebrew Bible in the making. It's sponsored by the Cardinal Bea Center for Judaic Studies and the B Biblical Institute, and especially with the support of the Bernard Meyer Barner family. So um, we're going to have an interesting presentation. I'm not sure how much time we'll have for discussion, but I'll leave this to Dominic Markle, who will introduce the panel, and he'll be the moderator as well. So welcome. Thank you very much to our rector, Professor Kolacic. Thank you very much uh, to you all for your interest. Since this uh, event is open to the public, I shall give a very brief introduction uh, on this, to this session on the Hebrew Bible and the making. Um, although we discuss very frequently how the Hebrew Bible evolved uh, in antiquity, this is not really our concern today, but rather we will look at how the Hebrew Bible is reprodu uh, reproduced, that is, edited in three different contemporary edition projects. As it is uh, commonly known, the most ancient biblical manuscripts that are known today are the ones from Qumran and the Dead Sea, uh, uh, that were written between the 2nd uh, century BCE and the 1st century CE. In addition to these quite fragmentary Hebrew manuscripts, we have ancient manuscripts of Greek and other translations of the Hebrew Bible, most famously the Codex Sinaiticus and the Codex Vaticanus from the 4th century. Um, yet the earliest complete manuscripts of the Hebrew Bible are much more recent. They date from around a thousand of the common era, most famously the Codex Aleppo and the Codex Leningradensis. These manuscripts differ, of course, to a certain extent, and whoever tries to provide a critical edition of the Hebrew Bible uh, um, faces the challenge as to what text should be presented. The classical and most commonly used is the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia, and currently the fifth edition of this uh, uh, is produced. Uh, for example, this is the volume on Deuteronomy. At the same time, there are two other critical edition projects. Um, the Hebrew University Bible project that presents principally the Codex Aleppo, on Isaiah with an extensive critical apparatus and the Hebrew Bible, a critical edition, presents an eclectic critical edition. We are most honored and pleased to have four leading experts on these matters on our panel who will present and discuss these issues today. Three experts will have five minutes each to present each of these projects. Uh, after this, um, uh, Professor Williamson will give a response of about 15 minutes and then we shall have some time for discussion. Our first speaker is Professor Michael Siegel from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Professor Siegel has published extensively on the book of Daniel and on textual criticism. He has been involved in the Hebrew University Bible Project since 2005 and he is the editor of this edition project. I should say that at this very Roman Catholic institution, we are especially happy to welcome our uh, Jewish, esteemed Jewish colleagues. Professor Siegel, we look forward to your presentation. Uh, good morning. You can read. <laughs> okay, I guess it's working. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that introduction, and thank you very much for uh, hosting this panel. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to show a short uh, PowerPoint about some of the basic aspects of the uh, Bible project. Um, then I will discuss a few of the uh, advantages, uh, or not advantage, the differences of the Bible project as opposed to the other projects which you'll hear about uh, uh, after me. 
um, specifically focusing on some of the issues that have come up in our preparation of the 12 profits, which we have completed the preparation, now we are uh, in uh, process of production. I'll end with a few issues that have come up in our new work on the Book of Joshua, which is our next volume, uh, and we'll see if we have any time left in the 25 minutes for some general remarks, which I doubt, but uh, I have material if I want to speak about other things. Um, how does this work? Okay, um, so just a, a basic uh, description of the Hebrew University Bible Project edition is a diplomatic edition. Uh, two of the editions here are diplomatic editions, uh, the Hebrew University Bible Project and the Biblia Hebraica series, um, based uh, with the base text being the Aleppo Codex, as you heard, uh, the Aleppo Codex uh, from the 10th century CE, uh, which is the most uh, accurate of medieval manuscripts of the Masoretic text. Uh, Maimonides in his uh, uh, Mishneh Torah, in his uh, compendium, uh, descri describes the great precision uh, of this codex, um, and this has been verified uh, for other reasons by, uh, scholars, by modern scholars as well. Um, the reason why not everybody uses the, sorry, the other direction. Well, we'll get to it in a second. Uh, the reason why not every project uses the Aleppo Codex, if it's such a wonderful manuscript, uh, why it's not used as the base project for other uh, projects, is um, primarily uh, is also one of the drawbacks of the, uh, using the Aleppo Codex, and that it's not complete uh, today. Um, we're missing most of the Pentateuch, most of the Torah, and as you'll see as I go on, uh, a issue that, an issue that came up in the preparation of the 12 Prophets volume, we're missing a third of the Aleppo Codex in the 12 Prophets. It's just no longer uh, in the Codex. Um, the, in the 1940s, two uh, major events happened uh, in terms of discoveries or in, in textual criticism, uh, especially uh, in Jerusalem. One was the arrival of the Aleppo Codex uh, by way of Syria, and the other was uh, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, of course, uh, both of these events together uh, created great excitement in terms of uh, for textual critics in general, um, and that led to the decision or the proposal by my predecessors, primarily Professor Moshe Goshen Goldstein, uh, to propose a uh, critical uh, edition, uh, the most extensive critical edition possible, tracing all possible evidence uh, from the earliest manuscripts, including the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, through uh, the medieval period all the way up to um, the Venice Rabbinic Bible in uh, the 16th century. Um, as you can see, what you see on the screen now is a sample page uh, from the Bible project. This is from the book of Ezekiel. Um, the base text, uh, as I said, is the Aleppo Codex, followed by extensive textual apparatuses. Um, you can see we have four uh, apparata uh, on this page, I don't know if you, can you see that? One, two, three, four, um, and, sorry, and as well as explanatory notes. Um, the, clearly the amount of sexual evidence in this edition is uh, more extensive than any other uh, current edition, um, and I'll go into some detail about uh, what we check what other, in comparison to other editions, um, which makes our apparatus uh, much more, uh, that much more extensive. I keep on doing the wrong direction here. Okay, so as I already mentioned, the base text is the Aleppo Codex. Here's a picture of the Aleppo Codex. Uh, the production of this text is, we try to be as uh, precise as possible in the production of, uh, or the copying of the Aleppo Codex into our edition, including consonants, vocalization, cancellation, and Masora Parva and Masora Magna. In other words, the extensive critical notes, which are one of the found fundamental aspects of Masoretic Codices, are, are all in our edition. The one, um, change that we had to make uh, primar on, based only on aesthetic reasons alone is that in the Aleppo Codex, if you've ever seen the Codex, it's in three columns. And it was very difficult to produce that in a modern printed edition. So we moved it from three columns to one column, but I hope people will forgive us for that. Other than that, it's as precise as possible in terms of copying. Um, the four uh, apparatus, the four apparata apparatuses, are uh, composed of the ancient translations, the ancient Hebrew evidence, uh, divergent medieval manuscripts and Masoretic manuscripts. Uh, and here, let me speak about each of these, uh, what each of these contains, um, and uh, what there is here that isn't elsewhere in other editions. Uh, so, first of all, uh, we check all of the 
uh, in the first apparatus, the ancient translations, um, all of the ancient evidence, including Greek, Latin, Syriac, and Aramaic, which theoretically is in all other editions as well. Um, one of the things, though, that we are very uh, insistent upon, um, and this has a major impact, actually, on the presentation of the material, is that we don't just use the base text produced in critical editions of these versions. So for example, in some of the other editions that will be presented here, when they check the Septuagint, it's based on the base text of the Septuagint in the Gertzingian edition. Um, we also act, use the extensive manuscript evidence in the critical apparatus of the Gertzingian edition. We have to remember it's a, uh, an eclectic edition. Frequently, uh, what appears in the base text is the choice of the editor of that specific volume. Um, and if you only check the base text, so then you will not, will you, you, important readings will uh, be lost. So we not only check, uh, we don't go back to check the manuscripts themselves, but we ex use extensive uh, text critical evidence provided by editors of other projects, uh, and we try to use it as completely as possible. Um, ancient Hebrew evidence is primarily th from three sources, the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, as I mentioned above, let me say one thing about that, which in Dead Sea Scrolls includes both uh, the direct evidence of biblical text in the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, which is relatively easy to record because uh, it's Hebrew versus Hebrew, um, but in some ways more interesting, uh, and it came up a number of frequently in the Twelve Prophets, are uh, what we might call either parabiblical texts or exegetical texts uh, of the Twelve Prophets in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So for example, the Pesher texts, um, in uh, the Twelve Prophets have both quotations, and here when I keep on saying more interesting, and more interestingly, uh, frequently even if the text reflect, the quotation reflects one reading, the interpretation uh, which accompanies the text uh, might reflect a different reading, uh, and we analyze all of these uh, in our recording of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, quotations in rabbinic literature. Here, uh, this is, and I'll discuss this more extensively in a moment, uh, one of the major uh, textual, major sources for textual criticism, which is, goes unused in most editions. Um, in rabbinic literature, uh, there are tens of thousands of quotations of, um, of the biblical text. Uh, all other editions, at least that I know of, rely on uh, compilations of, of, by previous scholars, primarily Uptowitzer's uh, compilation. Um, we, on the other hand, check here we do original research and check uh, all the manuscripts of uh, rabbinic literature, and I'll show you the extensive evidence that we compile um, in order to uh, assess these uh, quotations. And finally, the Samar Samaritan Pentateuch. This is very optimistic because this is when we get to the Pentateuch in the Hebrew University Bible Project, the Samaritan Pentateuch will be in this apparatus. Okay, so when uh, one of my students or students, students or students, students, students gets to the Pentateuch, uh, this will be here. We've already reserved a place for the Samaritan Pentateuch. Okay, next slide. It seems to be stuck. Okay, um, the, f the third and fourth apparatus both deal with uh, medieval manuscripts different kinds of medieval manuscripts. The first is actually very extensive evidence, um, which has not, in my opinion, has not received enough attention in uh, biblical studies. I mean, in the past few decades, it has received much more attention. Um, our Gniza fragments of uh, texts uh, from, uh, from the Cairo Gniza. Um, here I'm referring to uh, not the Tiberian Masora, as we, the, Aleppo Codex and Leningrad Codex belong to the Tiberian Masorah, but primarily to the Babylonian and Palestinian Masorah. Um, and here, once again, we do original research and go to the fragments. All the fragments are available now online, actually, for anybody who's interested in this kind of project. Um, at, one, at one point it wasn't, but now everything is digitized and available online, and we have extensive uh, textual evidence of each of the books. Um, and here, I'm not going to go into detail about all of the manuscripts that we use, but we take a... Uh, a, what, what was determined by, originally by Goshen and subsequently by other uh, members of the project to be the most important manu Masoretic manuscripts from the medieval period text, from a textual perspective uh, are included. And as I said, the final end point of the recording of evidence is the Venice Rabbinic Bible uh, from 1525. Okay, this is all 
all of this evidence, which was that large block on the page below the uh, body of text, uh, is accompanied by explanatory notes. What you see before you is in Ezekiel. Uh, you have English on the left and Hebrew on the right. Uh, this was done to have, in both languages, was done here, I'll be honest, was done for nationalistic reasons, uh, the revival of Hebrew, to have both English and Hebrew. And it actually was somewhat complicated because there are certain texts which appeared in their original language in the English and then were translated in the Hebrew on the right, um, which is fine if you know, if you know both, in other words, that was the system. If you know both English and Hebrew and you know to look from the English notes to the Hebrew, it was uh, doable. Um, in the 12 prophets, uh, we only will have English uh, notes. When I say only English, English plus all of the texts in their original language and translations of texts from, or readings from their original language will be into English. It'll be one uh, apparatus. We'll still keep it in two columns, so it, the, you know, it won't look like we've changed it, but we have, we have changed it to make it more, uh, hopefully more user-friendly. Um, and by translating it into English, we hope that uh, it'll be uh, more, in other words, translating original text into, readings into English will be more, uh, uh, will be easier for the user to, to, use this appar to use these explanatory notes. Okay, um, so far we've produced three volumes. Uh, this is approximately 50 years in three volumes. Um, let me speak about that a little bit. I, I can't be blamed for that uh, completely. I mean, for the past five years or so, perhaps. Um, it's a very extensive project, as you can see. We check all, almost all of the materials in the original. The entire project is done in-house at Hebrew University. In other words, as opposed, once again, we'll hear about the other editions, which are international teams of scholars. This edition is done in-house. Um, another uh, difference, I think, but here they can tell the, my, I was gonna say my competitors, but I don't mean competitors, my colleagues. Uh, the, in terms of how we work, uh, we, each apparatus is actually uh, prepared by a different team of scholars. So for example, the people who work on the rabbinic material are scholars from our Talmud department. The people who work on the, med on the medieval texts are scholars who specialize in Masoretic manuscripts. Uh, the people who work on the versions are people you know, in addition to biblical scholars, we have a team which includes a classicist and a linguist of, uh, of, of Semitic languages. So that each apparatus is, is theoretically done by the specialist in uh, that field. And then we take all of the material which each apparatus does on its own and then we compare and we, can, we uh, have cross-references between the different apparatuses. And as editor, I'm supposed to be in charge, involved in all of the apparatuses and uh, um, sort of so that we all know uh, what the other one, what each apparatus is doing, um, and connect readings that are found across uh, the different teams. Um, as I said, we're about to come out with the 12 prophets that will come out this academic year. It's at the, uh, the uh, layout designer, I don't know the term for the person, the person who, it's a very complicated layout, and hopefully that'll be out soon, and we're already working on Joshua, but the, the 12 prophets are done. Um, so here I want to spend a couple of minutes uh, talking about uh, some of the unique aspects um, which uh, have emerged from the project. Um, and here, this is a little bit less uh, directly related to uh, you know, what the users see in the edition, but it's an important byproduct of uh, our research. And that's a database of biblical quotations in rabbinic literature. Um, as I said, one of the things that we... Sorry, not that. One of the things that we have done, that, or that we do, is that we uh, check uh, every quotation of, of the biblical book across a very broad section of uh, rabbinic literature. Um, and just to give an idea, I have to switch to the right file now. Um, this is uh, from the book of Malachi. It's all in Hebrew, but uh, here it says at the top, top line. Uh, sources of quotations of Malachi in rabbinic literature, and for each verse there is a uh, reference. It doesn't appear on the screen. It doesn't appear on the screen. Okay, thank you for telling me that. Uh, one second. I think I have a solution. Now it does. Okay, thank you. Um, so here, once again, uh, this, this file, just uh, this is one of our internal, I'm showing you internal files, secret files of the Hebrew University Bible Project. Here is a, uh, I should ask you to turn off the video so that, uh, no, I'm joking. Um, uh, here, so here we have compiled all of the sources. Um, highlighted in yellow are those that don't appear in current, there's a, it's the standard index for quotations 
uh, in rabbinic literature, biblical quotation is, uh, is Hyman's HaTorah Ktuvah V'Hamsura. Uh, it's a standard work. Um, if you want to know where, you can check relatively easily. And every reference here in yellow was not in that reference work. So in other words, there are extensive, this is sort of the first thing that we do. We amass all of the quotations. Um, then we prepare a uh, Excel file. This is the entire 12 in rabbinic literature, where for every single verse in uh, the 12 prophets, you can see that's on the right, on the right side, starting from the book of Hosea, 1-1. Uh, one, one. And across the top, you have the list of rabbinic, uh, rabbinic um, compositions, so where these verses are quoted. So here, uh, the book of Hosea, chapter 1, verse 6, is in Seder Eliyahu Zuta, and in Psikta Rabati, and it goes on and on. In other words, you can see, uh, you can see every composition. It's a very long, it's a very, since there are many rabbinic compositions, uh, it keeps on going on and on. Okay. Now, we take all of this material, and then we, uh, for every verse, we create an Excel file. Because in every rabbinic composition, uh, what Optivitzer did, which was understandable, was he took the standard uh, editions of uh, the works, and he said, where are their differences? Um, for those who've worked with rabbinic manuscripts, um, know that that's not enough. Why is that not enough? For a number of reasons. One is that uh, we now have more manuscripts than we used to. We, light years ahead of where we were in the time of Optivitzer. But moreover, well, if you study the manuscripts carefully, you can see that uh, frequently the, many of the manuscripts are corrected towards the Masoretic text in their quotations. Um, and therefore, it's very important to, correct, to check each manuscript of uh, the manuscript evidence that we have. Um, and when you do that, there are more textual variants uh, than uh, previously thought. So for example, let me show you one example. I'll just show you one example because I don't want to take here. I didn't mean to click on that. Um, let's look at uh, here. Malachi chapter 3, verse, sorry, verse 5. Okay. Okay. Here on the top line is uh, the quotation from, from the Aleppo Codex or from standard uh, uh, Masoretic text. Uh, on the right are the lists of, can, yeah, you can see it now. On the right are the list of uh, rabbinic compositions and the list of the manuscripts. So, for example, Tal the Babylonian Talmud tractate Chagiga, we have in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven manuscripts that we've checked. Um, and it's not always identical in each of the manuscripts. Uh, if you see, every time there's red in the, uh, in the database, um, that means there's a difference from uh, the Masoretic text in the standard manuscripts that we have. So here, for example, very, it's very strongly attested instead of uvanish ba'im. Um, in rabbinic texts, rabbinic literature, you have uvanish ba'im bishmi, who, who uh, take an oath in my name, as opposed to just take an oath. Uh, I think that's, um, it's, ex it's primarily in the manuscripts of uh, the Babylonian Talmud of Masechet Chagiga, but not only. It's also found in Tanchuma manuscripts, etc. And this will go into our uh, edition. Ninety-nine percent of this material does not go into our edition. Ninety-nine percent, in other words, even when you find, as I said, there are many differences that arise because of scribal practices in rabbinic texts. There are differences that arise because of scribal corruption in rabbinic texts. So I would say ninety-nine percent of this research doesn't go into our edition. We only put in, we have very strict rules about uh, what goes in, um, but this is a database that we have sort of a byproduct uh, of what we have, and this is an example when I said that we have a team of scholars working on their specific field, so we have taken the team of rabbinic scholars, uh, and, and we would like to think this is sort of the, the highest level possible uh, for text criticism using uh, rabbinic quotations. I have thoughts about publishing this separately, uh, although I have to find the proper forum to do it. Um, a couple of publishers are interested, but they don't want it all in Hebrew. Um, I don't mean the text. The text, they're fine with Hebrew, but the names of rabbinic compositions and et cetera. So it's going to be a little bit of a mess. What I didn't, the other thing I didn't say, which is significant, is that we have for every verse in every manuscript, we have our own comments uh, up here about the nature of the reading. Okay, so here it's not just the, the, formal, uh, the formal notation, but here our staff notes 
Nishbaim um, Bishmi, it's also attested in the Septuagint, and then they give parallel verses which one should check out uh, which support this, uh, or which lead to this uh, harmonization or reading. And it's these readings actually which are the most, diff th these, interpret these explanations which are in Hebrew, which I don't know how can be translated easily, uh, but hopefully one day um, I'll be able to, we'll be able to get to that. How much more time do I have? Five minutes, okay. Uh, one other thing which I'll mention, I'm not going to go into details. Um, I mentioned that there are missing pages in the Aleppo Codex. For many years, people thought the Aleppo Codex, the missing pages were burned because it was, there was a fire in the synagogue in Aleppo in 1947. Today we know that it wasn't uh, burned. Uh, the missing pages were taken. There's a lot of controversy about who took it, when they took it, uh, et cetera. But for example, I showed you a picture before. I'm just going back very quickly. Apparently not so quickly because it's stuck. Um, of a fragment that was returned uh, just a few years ago, um, which you can see in the Israel Museum of the Book of Exodus, and there'll be a Yossi Ofer is publishing in, in, the in Textus, which is about to come out, uh, publishing this, um, this fragment. Clearly there are fragments out there, people took fragments with them uh, from Aleppo, um, and as I said, there's a little bit of political intrigue about what happened. These, these are fragments that came out a fragment that came back recently to Jerusalem. So clearly, this wasn't burned. Um, so the fragments, are, the fragments or the pages are out there, um, but that doesn't help us because we don't have them and we had to produce the 12 prophets volume. So what did we do in this case? So here, uh, I'm sure this will be the subject of criticism in reviews, or at least discussion in reviews. Um, this is the one place in our edition where we're not a diplomatic edition. Um, in Jer let me take one step back. In the Jeremiah volume, it already came up, because in Jeremiah, I think there are two pages of the Aleppo Codex which were missing. Um, in those two pages, the editors of that volume decided to use the Leningrad Codex. It was mentioned in the introduction, but there's no notation in the volume at that point itself that that's, that's what happened. Um, because of the extent of the material missing in uh, the 12 Prophets, we decided to do something uh, which at first glance seems to be much more drastic uh, let me just show you the list of passages missing in the Aleppo Codex there. That's what's missing in Jeremiah, and that's what's missing in uh, the Twelve Prophets. We decided to reconstruct the text of the Aleppo Codex uh, for those passages. As I said, it sounds very uh, radical. Everybody's looking at me now. <laughs> so uh, it's not as radical as it seems, because Masoretic scholars uh, have already determined that the uh, from already before 1947, which was the last time the codex was seen in its, in its uh, complete um, state, um, already the consonants, uh, the vocalization, um, and, the, um, and the cantillation uh, were either known, in other words, they're sort of, it's a very, those are relatively static, uh, and the, sort of the, the special places which were exceptional were already noted in most, uh, by scholars, uh, both traditional and critical scholars. Um, what is different, or what is dynamic, or which is hard to reconstruct, is one very, very minor part of it, the edition, which, or the manuscript, which almost nobody except very few scholars, very, I mean, and I say very few scholars, I'm not talking about 500 scholars or 100 scholars, I'm talking about probably 20 scholars uh, in the world would note uh, and be able to explain, are the rules for what are called ga'ayot, which are secondary, um, secondary stresses in the in a word. If you see that little under the hay of ha'olamot, it's the little vertical line next to the kamats under the hay. And there are rules about when this is supposed to happen, and uh, I'm not going to go through all the rules, but what's important is even though there are rules uh, in these manuscripts, there's inconsistent usage. And then the question is how to reconstruct it. And we have, uh, we, and I say we, uh, Dr. Rafael Zer, who works on the project, is a scholar of Masoretic Studies, proposed a radical uh, idea that we could use computer technology uh, to search uh, patterns in the Aleppo Codex in the part that's extant, and then to reconstruct uh, the Ga'ayot patterns in the part that is not extant, which at first I was very skeptical of, so I demanded that he do a test, a controlled test, on, and I said, pr 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 assume for a minute that we don't have Hosea chapter one, and do this, uh, do this reconstruction and tell me what happens. And it came back 100% correct. In the Ga'ayot, once again, if you give me another 20 minutes, I can show you the, how, how it's done, but I won't. Um, where it wasn't consistent in, uh, is the Masoretic notes. 
um, the Masoretic notes where they tell you how many instances of Ktiv Malek, Ktiv Chaser, or plain, or uh, where details the orthography, there the manuscript is not consistent, or the Aaron Ben Asher, the Masoret responsible for the manuscript, was not consistent in how he wrote or noted the material. He was, in a sense, unpredictable. Um, so our decision was, in those passages, we will reconstruct the text, but we will not reconstruct the Masoretic notes because um, we're confident that we can reconstruct the text, including its ga'ayot, but we're not confident we can reconstruct uh, the Masoretic uh, notes. We'll note in the apparatus, uh, the fourth apparatus, the Masoretic notes from the other manuscripts so that we don't lose, or, and elsewhere in the uh, Aleppo Codex, so we don't lose it. Uh, so, you know, so that's, it's, that it's there, but in terms of the notation, we're not willing to uh, note uh, differences. Um, I've reached my end. Um, okay, so I will not speak about specific examples, uh, which I, I did a little bit in the rabbinic text, um, and what I didn't get to were the differences in the Joshua volume, but uh, that will be for another day, I guess. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Thanks for your presentation and thanks also for the invitation to take part in this panel. I am very happy to come back to this Aula Magna where I followed many courses. I would uh, remember only one professor, uh, Carlo Martini, father and cardinal, who was my professor in textual criticism. Thanks. I should uh, remark that I am not editor of any book in the project I present. I was invited only to be a member of the scientific committee. Uh, therefore, I, I don't have real experience in this edition. Uh, as said, I am editor of the Book of Kings in the Septuagint uh, uh, series in Göttingen. That is a completely different uh, project. Well, next year is the 70th anniversary of the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Gunrad manuscripts have confirmed the antiquity of the MT, the Masoretic text, and the faithfulness of its textual transmission, but also the critical value of the Septuagint and its secondary versions. Gunram has also brought into the light that in Hellenistic or Second Temple times, biblical works circulated in different textual forms which could coexist in the same library such as Kunram's. This has considerably expanded the concept of Hebrew Bible, which is not, properly speaking, just the Masoretic Bible, but also includes new non-Masoretic Hebrew texts, among them those attested by the ancient versions, the Septuagint in particular. Thus, Kunram has been a stimulus for new edition projects of the Hebrew Bible, like those presented here. Next year will be the 500th anniversary of the first rabbinic Bible published in Venice in 1517, and also in the same year of the printing of the first polyglot edition of the Bible, the Complutensian, 
in Alcalá near Madrid. The Rabbinic Bible inaugurated the model of edition based in medieval Hebrew manuscripts, presently based on the best Ben Asher manuscripts, Aleppo Codex or Leningrad Thesis. The edition model of the Renaissance polyglots underscored the plurality of textual traditions represented in parallel columns by the Greek, Aramaic, Syriac, Bulgate, Latin, at times even Arabic and Persian, and starting with the Paris polyglot, also by the Hebrew Samaritan Pentateuch. Just five uh, centuries ago, in 1516, Erasmus published its edition of the New Testament. He thus inaugurated a different and new model of edition, the critical or eclectic edition, a standard practice in classical texts, and whose aim is to reconstruct the textual form or forms nearer to the original or originals. Nestle Allen's critical edition of the New Testament in its 28th edition is today universally accepted, also that has required five centuries to pass. Textual criticism of the Hebrew Bible has not followed a comparable development. The production of a critical eclectic edition of the Hebrew Bible was not seen as possible because variants in ancient versions could be attributed to a deficient knowledge of the Hebrew, to translators' interpretations, or many other reasons. But Kunram has yielded numerous Hebrew variants of proto-Masoretic texts, proto-Samaritan texts, texts related to the Septuagint, and even of unknown or mixed affiliation, classified as unaligned or independent. This textual plurality has to be reflected in the ongoing editions of the Hebrew Bible. The project, the Hebrew Bible a Critical Edition, is presented as an edition in parallel columns, like the classical polyglots and origins exaplan. In Ronald Handel's words, Ronald Handel is the chief editor of the project, the Hebrew Bible a Critical Edition aims to produce critical texts of each ancient edition, which will be presented in parallel columns, and to represent multiple early editions of biblical books in cases where such multiple editions are recoverable. In these cases, where one edition is not the textual ancestor of the others, a common ancestor to the extant editions will be reconstructed to the extent possible. The Hebrew Bible a Critical Edition is also presented in its very title as a critical edition, namely an eclectic edition which, in the vein of Greek and Latin classics, offers a critical text together with an apparatus including the textual data on which it is based and the textual commentary which explains and justifies the proposed critical decisions. But HBC cannot avoid following a copy text which has to be that of a manuscript, such as the Leningradensis. Thus, this project, though not in a manifest way, attempts to combine the three traditional models of edition of the biblical texts listed above. That is where its attractiveness and interests lie, together with criticism labeled at it as premature, or even impossible to be accomplished. First point, a synoptic edition in parallel columns. The existence of multiple early editions implies the presentation in parallel columns. Some books have a higher degree of textual plurality than others, and thus are more pliable to a parallel column edition. In Leviticus, like in Isaiah, according to Sariana Mezzo, editor of this book, the textual tradition at Qumran shows more textual stability than Exodus and Numbers. Her analysis proves, nevertheless, that the Old Greek preserves an alternative Hebrew version of Leviticus. In Deuteronomy, the editor, Sidney White Crawford, 
thinks that the idea, ideal edition of this book would be an electronic polyglot with five columns. The Masoretic text, the Samaritan Pentateuch, the Septuagint, the Qunram texts, and a fifth column for the critical and preferably embocalized text. Textual plurality is even higher in books where the combined testimony of Qunram and the Septuagint offers evidence of successive editions. These are Genesis chapter 5 and chapter 11, Exodus chapters 36, 36, 40, Numbers, Joshua, Judges, not in the same measure, Samuel, Kings, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Psalms, Canticles, and Daniel. I would remark that these books are basically the same ones that in the Greek textual tradition were affected by the Caige uh, Theodosionic Recension. Uh, these books are Exodus, Joshua Judges, Samuel Kings, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Job, Song of Songs, and Daniel. In these same books, the Old Latin witnesses the oldest Septuagint text, reflecting a Hebrew text different sometimes from the uh, Masoretic text. It attests at times readings unknown to the rest of the textual traditions, both in Hebrew and in other ancient versions. According to Emmanuel Tov, of the old versions, only the old Latin has any bearing on the Hebrew text of the Bible through its source that is not extant. All the other secondary translations have relevance mainly for the transmission of the Septuagint. The textual tradition represented by the Latin version is much richer and more varied than the Greek tradition. In Exodus, for example, the Old Latin reflects a Greek text representing the oldest Greek form that did not include the first description of the tabernacle or presented a very brief text of this section. The present Septuagint text constitutes an intermediate form between the first Greek version based on a very old Greek, a Hebrew, it attested by the Old Latin, and on the other hand, the Hebrew empty. Consequently, the books listed above are the most challenging books for textual criticism and for any critical edition, not only of the Hebrew text, but also of the Septuagint. Our new knowledge of the history of the biblical text shows that textual criticism of the Hebrew text and of the Greek version cannot be taken apart from each other. The critical edition of the Septuagint in the Göttingen series started one century ago, but it is not yet finished, and precisely the historical books, those where the uh, plurality, textual plurality is greater, uh, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings are just those books waiting for an edition. The Book of Kings is one of the books where textual plurality is the highest. At times, all Latin represents a shorter text than the Septuagint, in turn, shorter than MT, which agglutinates both previous forms. That is the case in 2 Kings 17, 721, you have it in your handout. In three columns, three possible columns. The textual units which constituted each edition seem to be clear as well as their order. Nevertheless, it is not possible to know the exact text of the beginning and the end of each literary unit in a textual stratum previous to the one represented by the Masoretic text. In the points of contact between the different units, textual variants appear, especially resumptive repetitions, as it is the case between verses 7 and 8, 14 and 15, 19 and 20. Thus, it is often impossible to reconstruct the precise text of each edition and develop a text in parallel columns. Thus, a project such as the 
Hebrew Bible Critical Edition, is saliently ideal for the treatment of more or less extensive sections of texts which vary between the different editions. But often, it is challenged by the impossibility or the difficulty of reconstructing the continuous text of each column. The non-Masoretic tradition has been preserved in a fragmentary state or through the versions which do not allow a safe reconstruction of a continuous and coherent text in all its grammatical, syntactic, and lexical details. Despite these and other difficulties, a synoptic edition in columns is possible and very productive. According to Emmanuel Toff, this system of the HBC is very good since the information concerning the two literary editions will pro probably be provided in full. The parallel columns in the two examples of Jeremiah 27 and 1 Kings 11 give room for optimism. The editor of 1 Kings, Jan Justin, has published a sample of the edition of chapter 11, verses 1-8, in two columns. According to him, the divergences between the Septuagint and the Masoretic text point to the existence of two distinct Hebrew editions of First Kings. It is not easy to determine which edition precedes the other. On the whole, MT reflects an older stage than G, than the Septuagint. But there are many details where the relation seems to be the reverse. After the two editions branched off from one another, each one of them continued to be altered by scribes. According to Emmanuel Toff, the Septuagint's editorial, editorial pluses, minuses, transpositions, and different chronology are usually later than empty. Nevertheless, this opinion on the Septuagint of Kings is not shared by all the scholars. A similar problem features in the books of Samuel and Jeremiah, where some scholars lean towards the earliness of the edition attested by the Septuagint, whereas some vouch for the historical priority of the Proto-Masoretic text. These positions roughly match of those who tend to think that Conrad has radically changed the history of the biblical text and therefore the practice of te textual criticism and those who, on the other hand, tend to minimize those changes. The differences of opinions between editors condition the results of any edition. The HBC team includes editors which may represent opposed positions, which is proof of its open spirit, though it may risk the coherence of the edition as a whole. The book of Jeremiah is in principle the most adequate for an edition in parallel columns and for a debate on the problems which I have summarized. The Septuagint and the Conrad manuscripts for Q Jeremiah, Jeremiah BD transmit a short edition of this book and MT together with manuscripts for Q Jeremiah AC represent a longer edition. And the editor, Richard Weiss, in his analysis of Jeremiah 23, points out the transposition of verses 7 to 8 from after verse 40 in the short text form to their position at the end of verse 6 in the long text form. According to Weiss, this is part of, I quote, a contextual adaptation or redactional change introduced in creating the long text form. Septuagint and MT constitute separate editions of the book, which must not be used to correct each other outside of the text they hold in common. The central issue when comparing MT and G is the differentiation of redactional or editorial differences from textual differences. Weiss touches here an issue which biblical textual criticism had, years ago, barely pondered previously. Its relationships, relationship with literary criticism, as the separation between both fields has become diffuse and permeable. 
again, scholars are split between two lines and tendencies. Some defend that textual criticism has to refrain from evaluating readings or sections of text generated in the process of edition or literary growth of a book. Others defend that the editing process and textual transmission overlap, and thus textual variants often echo early editorial processes, and editors' activity leave in prints in form of textual variants. Until now, parallel presentation of the two texts' forms have followed only one sequence, typically that of MT, where inevitably misrepresents, which inevitably misrepresents the other text form, the one represented by the short text in the case of Jeremiah, but in general also of the Septuagint. According to Richard Weiss, in an electronic edition, the correct order of each text form of Jeremiah can be encoded so as to allow the user to sort the verses to match the order of either text form and still be able to easily compare verses in, co in context. Often a textual variant in the Septuagint is overlooked because it features in a context different from MT. Thus, regarding the debate of the past years about the reading Bahar he has chosen in the Samaritan, Samaritan Pentateuch, or Jifhar, he will choose in the Masoretic text. Uh, scholars, uh, as David Carr, for example, and others, uh, quote the text of First Kings 14, 21, 21, the city which uh, Yahweh has chosen, but they do not take into account, or never is never taken into account, the parallel passages of the Old Greek in a parallel uh, passage in, in 1224a, which omits precisely that clause. Uh, the second point, a uh, critical edition. The SBC is an eclectic edition, which uh, I quote. Uh, Ronald Handel, is an eclectic edition which presents a critical text that is constructed by the textual judgments of the editors. The method is eclectic, drawing together the best readings from many manuscripts and where warranted conjectural readings. The reconstruction of the original or Ur text remains the theoretical object of textual criticism. Nevertheless, the oldest text which can be reconstructed is not that of an orthograph or of a first or last edition, but that of the archetype, archetype or the earliest inferable textual state of each edition of a book, which is an empirical and justifiable goal. The reconstruction includes emendations by the authors since the, since the archetype, like all manuscripts, will have scribal errors that can be rem remediated. In this way, biblical textual criticism distances itself from textual criticism of classical texts, whose manuscripts, manuscript tradition starts with an orthograph or author's work, let us say, Plato. An edition such in the same measure, it gets closer to criticism of text transmitted in a plurality of textual forms, like those of apocryphal and pseudo-epigraphic writings, and of Qunran, New Testament, and Rabbinic works. An edition such as has BC allows to reflect precisely those lines through which the text developed, both in its early phases and in those represented by the versions. The idea is to represent the historical changes in the text from the corrected archetype to the major, major manuscripts as a process of development, from the activity of editors to the transmission history at hands of copyists, 
translators and recensors. Third point, an edition based on MT as a copy text. The MT is, is a, the necessary copy text for this edition. The concept of copy text derives uh, pr from the study of Renaissance literature. It is a valid instrument for the edition of texts characterized by their transmission in multiple editions and it satisfies the need of taking apart between substantive readings, uh, words and or lexemes of a critical text, which are the prime focus of the textual critique, and the accidental accidentals of the text, which are everything else, including features of spelling, punctuation, etc. The SBCE uses the orthography and vocalization of MT. This gives rise to issues that prompted an interesting discussion some years ago, fostered by Professor Williamson in a paper published in Biblica and in a public lecture given at the Pontifical Biblical Institute here on March uh, 20, uh, 2009. While stating, stating that the text critical work of the proposed edition is entirely justified and indeed necessary, and these are words of Professor Williamson, Man he manifests his reservation regarding the distinctive nature of the Hebrew text, problems with the textual archetype, and the reception of the edition. The criticism, the criticisms in plural, addressed to this project can be summed up by the Emmanuel's, Emmanuel Tov's recent affirmations. Given the small number of preserved ancient and late ancient Hebrew biblical manuscripts, especially the reconstruction of a corrected archetype remains a text critical exercise that is of great interest for textual critics, but only of limited use for other biblical scholars. The enterprise of reconstructing an archetype becomes all the more problematic if scri scribal errors of the supposed archetype are amended. The result is a theoretical ideal text of a given biblical book that oh, most likely never existed. The artificial character of the eclectic text of this project becomes even more evident when it adds to its reconstruction the variant vocalizations and accentuation. Both are medieval and were never part of the ancient corrected archetype the SBCE wants to reconstruct. End of quote. An eclectic edition, as in the Septuagint and the New Testament, is not, I think, a pure intellectual exercise interesting only for textual critics. It has relevant consequences for any exegetical and historical study of the Hebrew Bible, particularly in the historical books and in the prophetical books. It might be well that the result is to some extent a theoretical ideal text, but in many details that go from some single words and reach complete verses and even large sections of the text, a synoptic and eclectic edition underlines the variety of readings and textual forms or editions of the Hebrew Bible in its formative period in the Bible in the making, the title of this uh, panel, in its formative period in Qumran times. The, this project is to a great, a great extent in theory and allows for modifications and adaptations according to characteristic, characteristics of each book and the perspectives of each editor. It would not be strange if it took in the future the form of an electronic edition that could furnish the necessary flexibility to present various archetypes and also various textual develop, developments in the textual transmission, 
in fact, as stated recently by Ronald Rendell, I quote, the new digital technology allows for further innovation. The electronic SPC, as we envision it, will reproduce the critical edition of the print volumes and will supplement it with a hypertext of all the relevant texts and versions, including photographs of important manuscripts and other text critical aids. If I look back when I was a student uh, here in the Pontifical Biblical Institute, textual criticism at that time was considered a boring, hard, and useless topic. <laughs> Mainly because it was thought that everything was already done. Nowadays, it is an indispensable task, hard as yet if possible, but very interesting, I would say even amusing sometimes. And above all, it is a field of research where new generations of scholars can make significant progress in research on the biblical text in Hebrew, the Septuagint, and in the ancient versions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Cebolem. Um, maybe we should uh, show oh, the yes. volume uh, on uh, Proverbs, uh, edited, uh, uh, appeared in uh, 2015, so the first volume, if I'm not mistaken, of this edition project, edited by uh, uh, Michael Fox. Um, maybe. Excuse me, I had a reference in my paper about to uh, and this edition, who renounced to make two, uh, two columns, yeah. and he explains why. <laughs> and uh, Ron Handel, the general editor of the project, is well known to many of us because he participated last year at our conference here. Uh, our third speaker is Professor Steve, Steve Pisano, who has been teaching at this institute since 1982. He has been involved in the editorial board of uh, the Biblia Hebraica Quinta from its very beginning in 1990. Professor Pisano, we look forward to your presentation. Uh, one of the advantages of being the, the third speaker is having heard the first two. And I, so I would like to make two uh, preliminary remarks before uh, discussing the Biblia Hebraica Quinta. The first is that uh, I think that it's important to see a complementarity uh, among these three projects in these three editions, that each one has a very different purpose, a very different scope, uh, a very different history. And uh, I don't think that uh, we uh, are required to, to make a choice, but rather to see the, the complementarity of, of these three editions and of the wealth of material that each one, uh, each one provides. The second uh, preliminary observation is that frequently with these uh, projects, uh, people complain about the length of time that it takes to complete them. Uh, and uh, I think we have to remember uh, for the critical edition of the Latin Vulgate, uh, the Council of Trent in 1546 mandated uh, the publication of a critical edition of the Vulgate. This was finally accomplished for the Old Testament in 1995. <laughs> <laughs> and at that time, a decision was made not even to begin on the New Testament. So we are still within reasonable limits. <laughs> the Biblia Hebraica Quinta stands in the tradition of editions of the Hebrew Bible, which began with the first edition by Kittel in Leipzig in 1906. Now, I'm af afraid that some of these might not be too visible. That's okay. Kittel took as his base text the, take, the text of Jacob ben Chaim, which appeared in the 
rabbinic Bible published by Bomberg in 1524-25 in Venice. Then a second edition of the Kittel Bible with the same base text appeared in 1913 with only minor changes. The third edition of the Biblia Hebraica was published beginning in 1929, but appeared as the full edition in 1937. This time it was the same editor, Kittel, uh, but this time chose the Leningrad Codex as his base text and significantly reworked the critical apparatus. Then during the years from 1967 to 1977, the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia, published by the German Bible Society, continued the same use of the Leningrad Codex with a new set of editors and the critical apparatus was again reworked significantly, based partially on material from the Dead Sea Scrolls, although this material was never fully or systematically incorporated into the apparatus. Since the Stuttgartensia was considered the fourth edition of the Bible in the, three, in the uh, tradition of the three editions of the editions published by Kittel, the term Biblia Hebraica Quinta was chosen to indicate that it is the successor to these earlier editions, so the fifth in the line of these, of these texts. So the Quinta, as its uh, immediate predecessors, offers a diplomatic uh, presentation of the Leningrad Codex in the sense that it provides, along with the Masoretic text, the Masoromania and Parva, in their entirety as they appear in the manuscript. This is one page uh, from the book of Genesis, the most recent volume to appear. And just to, uh, so you can see, in the uh, uh, side margin, the uh, Masora Parva, as it appears uh, in the uh, Codex Leningradensis, and then as the first apparatus, the Masora Magna of the uh, Lodengradensis has been uh, reproduced uh, exactly as it appears in the manuscript. Now, these two uh, Masorot the, uh, uh, frequently need explanation, especially the large Masora, which uh, as it's presented is very difficult for the user to uh, understand. So the addition of the Quinta provides a uh, a commentary on these the, the two Masoras. First of all, on the Masora Parva, in uh, which uh, s uh, selected uh, annotations are indicated with a brief commentary on each one, uh, so that uh, some of the rather enigmatic Masoretic uh, remarks uh, become clearer uh, with this uh, with this commentary. Then with regard to the uh, Masora Magna, there is a full translation of the Masora as it appears in the manuscript and where uh, necessary, a commentary. So here, for example, for uh, the beginning of Genesis for Bereshit, three times at the beginning of a verse, Genesis 1.1, Jeremiah 26.1, 27.1, and twice within a verse, Jeremiah 28.1, 49.34. This is simply a translation of the Masoda Magna as it appears in the manuscript. And then frequently there is a, sl a small commentary uh, along with the uh, Masoda. For this here, for example, that the note erroneously preats uh, Malkut as the reference to Jeremiah 28, the correct reading is Mamlakot. So uh, where there is, is, is a mistake or uh, something unclear, uh, in the Masora, uh, this commentary uh, discusses discusses that uh, that question. Although uh, the committee decided to maintain the Leningrad Codex as the base text, the editors were fully aware of the value of other manuscripts, especially the Aleppo Codex. But since so much of that venerable manuscript is missing, it seemed better to stay with the Leningrad text. 
The text, though, is collated with the Lepocodex where possible and collated also with other Tiberian uh, manuscripts uh, in terms of the text and also for certain other phenomena. So, for example, uh, each edition uh, has an appendix which uh, presents the, the open and closed sections uh, of uh, each of the manuscripts which have been collated. So here, for example, uh, this is the uh, Codex Lerengradensis, uh, then this is the uh, Codex uh, Sassoon, or the, uh, known as the Damascus Pentateuch. Uh, this is a manuscript uh, that is in the uh, library, National Library in St. Uh, Petersburg, and uh, the Oriental uh, 4445 in the British uh, Library uh, in London. So uh, this provides a, uh, a collation that shows where uh, there are open and closed sections in each of the manuscripts, and uh, they, they, they don't always agree. Uh, here, for example, one uh, Leningrad Codex has, has an, uh, the, the uh, open and the other, uh, the, the closed. So just to show that, that these, how these manuscripts have been uh, collated. Each uh, book editor is responsible for the critical apparatus of, of his or her individual book, as well as for the commentary on select readings. And the uh, committee is made up of uh, an international team of scholars. Um, I should mention that uh, uh, professors uh, Robert Altan and uh, Augustinus Gianto and Craig Morrison here at the Biblicum are part of this, uh, this project as well. Since this edition is the heir to the Hebrew Old Testament text project of the United Bible Societies, which was the work of a committee consisting of, I might say, our, um, uh, our predecessors, Dominique Barthélemy, Alexander Hulst, Norbert Lofink, W.D. McCarty, Hans-Peter Rüger, and James Sanders, their discussion of over 5,000 text-critical cases, which was published in the preliminary and interim report, is taken into consideration, as well as the material published in the work by Barthélemy, Critique Textuelle de l'Ancien Testament. Although each book editor is free to develop his or her own presentation and evaluation of each case, in order to ensure a certain amount of uniformity, a set of guidelines for contributors uh, has been developed, and uh, each uh, book is then uh, proofread by the editorial uh, committee. The norms for determining which cases should be included in the apparatus are, first of all, that the case should be text critically significant. This means that a variant in another Hebrew manuscript or in one of the ancient versions should arguably, but not necessarily, represent a Hebrew text different from the base text of the Leningrad Codex. The second norm for the inclusion of the discussion of a case, uh, if it is considered to be potentially significant for the translation or exegesis of a text, even though it might, might not be, strictly speaking, a text-critical issue. And this second norm corresponds to one of the main uh, uh, purposes of this edition, that is an instrument for students and for translators of the Bible. So even certain cases that are technically speaking are not text-critically uh, 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 text critical cases, they are included if, the, in the history of exegesis, they are particularly important. All cases of variant readings from the material found at Qumran, Masad, and Murabaat, uh, as well as cases of Kirjiv Kare, when they are not simply orthographic differences, are included, as well as the variants found in the, in the Samaritan Pentateuch, of course, the Septuagint, Old Latin, Peshitta, Vulgate, Targumim, and other ancient translations where they seem to presuppose a different underlying Hebrew text. The Quinta Committee decided to depart from the Biblia Hebraica practice of citing the medieval manuscripts in the collations of Kennecott and de Rossi and the editions of Ginsburg. These variants are referred to only if there is some variant in another part of the textual tradition that they agree with. On the other hand, 
all of the material of the Dead Sea Scrolls is included. A novelty in this edition is that insofar as possible, the apparatus provides not only variant readings, but also a brief evaluation of the readings. So uh, here, for example, you see that uh, in addition to the material presented with the, uh, the different witnesses, frequently there is a brief evaluation. For, for example, in uh, the mind of the book editor, uh, the reason for the uh, variant was assimilation to the context. So this is uh, uh, in order to uh, help the, uh, the reader uh, understand the uh, reason perhaps for some of the variants. Cases that require more treatment are discussed in the commentary on a, a, a commentary in the critical apparatus at the end of each volume. In evaluating the variant readings, the aim of this edition is to indicate the earliest attainable form or forms of the text based on available evidence of the ancient witnesses. So I'll repeat that because it's an, it's an important. The aim to indicate the earliest attainable form or forms of the text based on available evidence of the ancient witnesses. This means that readings other than those found in the Masoretic text may be preferred, and the reasons for that preference are discussed in the apparatus commentary. So far, the volumes that have appeared are Genesis, Deuteronomy, Judges, the Minor Prophets, Proverbs, Megillot, and Ezra and Nehemiah, and the books of Leviticus and Ezekiel are in the final stages of preparation. I think it might be helpful at this point to take one uh, small example, which uh, I'll present uh, quickly. From uh, This is from Genesis, which is the most uh, recent uh, one to appear. Genesis 4.8, which is a very problematic text. And Cain said to his brother, he doesn't say anything to his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. So this is the Masoretic text. Uh, uh, it should be noted out, as we, we will see in the apparatus entry, uh, that the Septuagint here provides what is missing. Uh, Cain says to Abel, the elthomen eis to bedion, let us go into the field. The Vulgate, egediamur foras. And it should be noted that there is a uh, text from the Dead Sea Scrolls from Qumran, 4Q Genesis B, which is dated to the first century of the Common Era. And here it should be noted that the text here follows the Masoretic text. So, Hevel Archiv, Vayehi. So, Cain's words to Abel, let us go into the field, are not present in this uh, uh, Qumran manuscript. Now, how is this case treated in the, uh, the Quinta uh, edition? First of all, for verse 8, it is noted that that uh, uh, Qumran manuscript and one and the Targum Unkelos uh, have Achiv along with the Masoretic text, therefore without the longer text. But then the apparatus notes that this, that Achiv is followed by Nachre Hasade, let us go into the field, in the Samaritan Pentateuch, the Greek Septuagint, the Vulgate, the, the uh, Targum Jonathan, the other uh, tar, uh, Targumim, 
with the evaluation given by the text editor, in this case, uh, Professor Abraham Tal, which would be harmonization to the context. And then uh, he notes that the Peshitta has something slightly different, but in the, basically the same idea, harmonization to the context, with this, this little sign at the end indicates that there is a There is a comment on this in the commentary on the critical apparatus. And in this particular case, it's a bit lengthy. So it's noted, with the exception of the Targumonculus and Aquila, according to a note of origin, all versions try to fill in the apparent lacuna in M. Even the Vulgate does so, in spite of Jerome's declaration that the addition in question is superfluous. Also noteworthy is the absence of the speech in Qumran fragment for Q Genesis B. The versions exhibit certain efforts to complete an incomplete text, which may suggest that the authors had before them a text not much different from the Masoretic text. Although their reading is quite uniform, it is impossible to determine whether the Samaritan Pentateuch and the Septuagint had a common source of inspiration, which was also in, which also influenced the Vulgate, or were independent from each other. The Targumim referred to the abundant homilies pre, pre, present in the extant collections of Midrashim. Rosa suggests a homeoteliotan in the Masoretic text. This may be supported by a number of Masoretic manuscripts, with which have an empty interval related by the, collect the collections of Kennecott and de Rossi. Ginsburg's sources, too, have such an interval, although in his notes he mentions in other books there is no interval at all. Why this would be important, whether there is or, is, or not an interval, was that this separates the, the speech of uh, Cain from the action that follows later on. So that is a possibility. I won't read all the rest of this note, but just uh, simply point out that uh, uh, the ed book editor here has also referred to uh, m material in, in the Genesis Rabbah, a Targumic Tosefta found in the Cairo Geniza. So this material, uh, which is not included uh, systematically as it is in the Hebrew uh, University Bible Project, is used when it is necessary to describe uh, uh, or uh, uh, discuss uh, some particular case. So I hope that this uh, brief uh, introduction gives you an idea uh, of this uh, uh, edition, which hopefully will, uh, be be f will be finished before the time it took to complete the edition of the Vulgate. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Pisano. I think this practical example was very helpful in the end. Our respondent is Hugh Williamson, Emeritus Regis Professor of Hebrew at Christ Church in Oxford, but he had spent also a great uh, part of his academic life at Cambridge. And this semester, we are proud that you are teaching here uh, at this institute. Hugh is a fellow of the British Academy, which means that he has enormous administrative responsibility for religion in academia in Great Britain. And it might be fair to say that he is the expert on the text of the book of Isaiah. Professor Williamson, we look forward to your response. Thank you, and uh, thank you to my uh, fellow panelists for presenting these three editions. When I uh, come to consider matters relating to textual criticism, my starting point, increasingly, as I get older, is an appreciation of the fact that in the Masoretic text, which we've heard a lot about, we effectively have two things in one. And this has a very important bearing, I think, on what we're trying to achieve in textual criticism. Clarity of aim, what are you trying to do, is a fundamental question. If I can explain a little further, and, and you'll see how this then relates to the various projects. 
In my opinion, the Masoretic text is a complete and integrated whole, and it can't be split apart. It's not just a consonantal text with some decorative vocalization and a few comments from some learned rabbis round the side. It's a complete whole, which includes everything that we are presented with. And it's a complete whole, not only in the provision of vocalization, but also in its linguistic system. And it includes a state of the Hebrew language which simply did not exist at the time when the Bible was written. The standard parade example for this is, of course, in the book of Ruth, where you have what in the, Masoret uh, in, in the earlier times must have been a feminine participle, but which is now by the Masoretes accentuated in such a way as to show that you have a definite article on a finite verb, which was perfectly acceptable in the middle of the first Christian millennium, but simply was not an existing form in the time when the book was written. Now, there are plenty of other examples of that which can be dug out. That's the one you'll find in all the textbooks. My former colleague, Jeremy Hughes, has written an article elaborating on several others and demonstrating that this is not an isolated phenomenon. But in fact, it goes into other matters too. And within this, it's not just language, but language within an agreed religious position that had developed by the time of the Masoretes, so that, for instance, the way that verbal forms are presented in some prophecies uh, are made into future predictions, which may not originally have been meant to be so by the vocalization. And so one could go on. That means that nowadays, quite unlike my student days, when I was a student, which was even longer ago than everybody else here. We were sort of taught, oh, you can amend them, you know, the vocalization doesn't matter, you can change that to something more sensible, which is a totally unhistorical appreciation of the material. And I now, I hope, will never talk about amending the vocalization. The Masoretes knew a great deal more about Hebrew, certainly than I do, and probably most of us in this room. And they vocalized it according to their understanding, and my duty is to try and understand what they were doing. Now, when I become a historical text critic, of course, I may say, well, I don't agree with their conclusion, and I might want to understand the text differently but I don't amend the vocalization because to amend the vocalization implies that there was an earlier text which had a different vocalization. But there never was such an earlier text. Of course, there was a reading tradition which the Masoretes very conservatively usually incorporate. But like in anything, like in the development of the language, so in the development of the reading, changes may have taken place over time. And so my first point really is to emphasize that and to ask of each edition how well they take that fact on board. And of course, it means also that in theory, I would have no objection to the development of an eclectic Masoretic text. It wouldn't be very different from Leningrad <laughs> or Ben Asher. But I mean, I've noticed that the Leningrad copyist or scribe had a little quirk where he doesn't like always putting the mapik in the hay, you know? Where you, uh, he just left it out sometimes. Now, I don't think he did it deliberately. I think he just forgot it sometimes or didn't use it. And so in an eclectic text, one would put that little dot in the hay on the basis of the other majority number of manuscript uh, evidence that we have. So one could have an eclectic Masoretic text, but it has to be the Masoretic text because it's part of a single system. And of course, when looking at that, uh, just let me put in as a side, that sometimes these Masoretic manuscripts have been used completely irresponsibly by otherwise extremely good scholars to propose emendations. The classic case I always bring 
is that a lot of people don't want the word Israel to appear in Isaiah 49 verse 3, even though it's in all the old manuscripts and all the old texts and all the traditions and versions. But Kennicott 96 doesn't have it. So they say, ah, we will read with Kennicott 96 and we'll leave it out. Now this is complete madness. As Tony Gelston has shown, Kennicott Manuscript 96 is a totally way out sort of manuscript that makes all sorts of errors and mistakes. And the possibility that a reading from an antiquity from the 5th century BCE survived until the second Christian millennium only to be attested in Kennicott 96 is beyond belief. Now, the Masoretic text, therefore, has to be understood and has to be taken seriously because it's the base text of the different editions. And it's interesting to me, uh, Professor Schenker, who's the editor-in-chief of the BHQ, has published a little article in the latest number of ZAW. It appeared in the library last week, in which he compares BHQ and the um, uh, Ron Hendel edition, as it were, which has now appeared with the Fox edition on um, Proverbs. And one of the things that he points out is that BHQ takes the Masoretic material seriously, and we've heard how the Masarapava and Magna are discussed and so on, in a way which the Hebrew Bible critical edition uh, doesn't, and it leaves it all out. So to me, one mustn't pick and mix. Pick and mix is an English expression from a sweet shop where children go with a little bag and they go around and they pick the sweets that they like and put them in a bag and, and pay for them. You cannot pick and mix in textual criticism. You have to understand the data and the Masoretic text is an important part of that. So on the one hand, we have a Masoretic text from the end of the first Christian millennium reflecting a venerable tradition but different in certain crucial respects from what Isaiah or Moses or David wrote. Now, moving back to historical textual criticism, we enter a different world with much more diffuse evidence and from a very different time period from the Masoretic manuscripts. And that's why I personally still maintain that textual criticism, historical textual criticism of the Hebrew Bible is not the same as with other texts, at least in degree. This is a discussion Hendel and I and Hendel's colleagues uh, continue to have. Because the data for historical textual criticism has first all to be evaluated, and it differs enormously from one thing to another. Uh, the Septuagint text, you've only got to look at the Göttingen edition to see how complicated that is textually. But in addition to that, in some books, particularly in Isaiah, the translator introduces much interpretative material in the process of translation. It's not that he departs very far from the Hebrew text, but in his rendering of it, he includes interpretation. And that has to be taken into account in text critical work. And what is true for that is true of all the other evidence, including the Dead Sea Scrolls and including the Masoretic text. Because as I've already indicated, the Masoretes include a degree of interpretation in the way that they vocalize and present the data. Now, at this point, whereas the Hebrew University Bible Project is of inestimable value, in my opinion, absolutely wonderful, for dealing with the Masoretic minutiae, it becomes a little bit more dangerous when it comes to the historical side. The data are there, as has been pointed out, but somewhat uncontextualized. In that first apparatus, where every change in the versions is carefully noted, they're noted on a piecemeal basis. And the apparatus, the commentary at the bottom of the page, does not yet, but I know things that there are improving because we've also discussed this, they don't sort of normally indicate that the Septuagint might have had this reading 
not because of translational textual questions, not because of textual questions, but because of translational and interpretative concerns. That has to be taken into account. And that's why the other two projects are so helpful, because the commentary gives scope to explain that. In Fox's um, edition, I think there's 40 pages of text of Proverbs and about 250 pages of commentary, something like that. I mean, it's just an enormous amount. And that's tremendously helpful. Of course, there is a practical problem that none of these editions will produce a nice little handy edition that we can carry around with us in our handbags. But anyway, that's, that's something else. Now, that was one of my main objections to the Hebrew Bible critical edition at an earlier stage, that it was showing a danger of mixing promiscuously the Masoretic presentation with historical reconstruction. They have made some changes, but I still think it's a problem because it presents as an eclectic text, that's to say, an attempt to reconstruct roughly a third century BCE high, I can never remember the word, but anyway, what lies behind all the evidence that we have. They still present a vocalized text. But of course the vocalization didn't exist for many centuries to come. And Hendel claims that the vocalization are just accidentals he uses as the example Shakespeare. Before Mr. Johnson invented the idea of a dictionary, you could spell a word any way you liked. And there's about six or seven different ways of spelling the name Shakespeare. And it doesn't matter at all. Shakespeare is Shakespeare is Shakespeare, whether you put an E on the end or not. That's an accidental. And Hendel says the vocalization are accidentals. But they're not accidentals. The vocalization is part of a complete system. When I used to teach, we used to do prose composition. I don't know whether you still do them here at the Institute. I used to give the students a passage in English, and they had to put it into vocalized biblical Hebrew. And that's great, and it's a fun sort of exercise to do, and it really tests one's knowledge of grammar. But it won't do, in my opinion, in an eclectic text which aims for an archetype as the latest common ancestor of all the extant witnesses. Because that text was written in Paleo-Hebrew, not the square script, and that's text critically important to know which letters might be confused. They're different in the different alphabets. It didn't have the vocalization, and of course the spelling was different and beyond recall. All the vowel letters, or many of them, uh, have come in during the course of transmission. And I think that to call all that accidentals uh, is to undervalue them. And that's the importance of Pro Pro Professor Tribola's paper today uh, in that light, because he has stressed that this edition is going to be a synoptic edition in parallel columns. The, the, the archetype of the Hebrew and of the Greek and maybe of some of the Dead Sea Scrolls and so on. And this parallel columns idea is developing much more than it was originally. I think when Hendel started, he probably thought it would do for Jeremiah and maybe Samuel, but he didn't go much further than that. But now we're finding many other books are being brought in, which is fine and, and helpful, and, and please don't get me wrong, I respect the scholarship of my colleagues on this very much, and I'm fascinated by what they're doing. But of course, if you're going to have parallel texts, you're no longer really producing an eclectic edition of the, the, the original one. You're, you're simply saying these are the witnesses towards it. In other words, it seems to me that Hendel is gradually coming to realize that his project is almost impossible, because with many of the books in the Hebrew Bible, not all, but with many, he said, he's effectively conceding that you cannot get back behind the extant textual witnesses. And Fox actually does that. Um, Proverbs was mentioned as one of the texts where, of course, the Greek Septuagint is miles away from the Hebrew text. And you'd expect parallel 
columns. But Fox says he can't do it. Uh, it's not possible. It's not, it's not reasonable. And interestingly, Ulrich, in a sample edition for Jeremiah, does it in parallel columns. It's fascinating. You've got his sort of eclectic text or the Masoretic text on the one column, and the other is what he believes to be the Hebrew version from which the Septuagint was translated. So the whole of that edition is a retroversion, a translation back from the Greek into the Hebrew, which is a very clever thing to do, especially as he vocalizes it, which is great. Um, but of course, it's inevitably hypothetical because however much you've got the Masoretic text to guide and help you with it, it is a scholarly exercise. It's not a presentation of data. So, as I say, to me, the great value in, in Fox's edition, and he's quite conservative really on the text in Proverbs, is the commentary. And that is to be welcomed even if it seems to me that the fundamental program as practiced uh, is still um, somewhat confusing. When it comes finally to BHQ, that, as we've heard, does aim at a complete presentation of the relevant data in the apparatus with explanation and discussion in the commentary. Uh, and that's very helpful. The apparatus, as we, as we went through, you can see is very compressed, and you have to sort of learn a new language of all those little signs and abbreviations, and you have to work quite hard at it. I went to a wonderful paper given by Carmel McCarthy, uh, who has done Deuteronomy, in which she was, and she took us through some of it, and it's absolutely fantastic work, but you really do need, a, you know, a, wet towel around your head and a strong cup of coffee uh, in order to understand the apparatus, but she's provided helpfully the commentary to explain it. Now, that's wonderful work, but many of us use our Hebrew Bibles not only for the very, very detailed kind of work, but if you're giving a sermon or a talk or a lecture or you're just looking up another verse to compare, you're unlikely to spend the time needed to go through all that detail to satisfy yourself. I mean, life's too short. And therefore, I wonder whether it wouldn't help for quick reference if there could be a new line in the apparatus in which the editors simply put where they favor an emendation. Instead of reading, Lo goi, in Isaiah 9, verse 1 or 2, it's hagilah. Now, that's a conjectural emendation. I think it's almost 99.9% .9 certainly correct. And where you have that emendation, obviously in a diplomatic text, it's not up there in the main text, but could they not just give us what would be each editor's um, eclectic reading, as it were, in a single line for quick reference? Uh, that might be helpful. Well, at this point, I, I must stop. Uh, I want to um, acknowledge how uncertain our results will be in this area, whichever edition we're working on or working with. There was once an eclectic text of the Hebrew Bible. It was called the Sacred Books of the Old Testament. And the edition on Isaiah was done by Karl Marty, and however many of you have ever consulted it. That's the problem. One or two may have done, but it's just forgotten now. Of course, we have much more information than was available to them then, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, to say the least. But even today, the evidence is partial and still dependent on retroversion. So my preference is not so much for new editions, although I'm all in favor of them. Uh, I think the way forward is through commentary which explains the situation, presents the data as fully as we're able, of course may give the commentators preference, uh, but for scholars who are working on it, uh, enables them to reach their own conclusions and to make each man and each woman her or his own eclectic text. Thank you. Thank you.